Hi, my name is Mark Hunneman, and this is an introduction to my systematic uh, theology series, subtitled Why Knowing God and Solid Biblical Content is Especially Important in a Pagan Culture. Let me define theology real quick. Theology is applying the whole of the Bible to the whole of life. For example, when we study God's omnipotence, we will ask, what does the entire Bible say about God being all-powerful? And then apply it. As I said, my name is Mark Hunneman, and in 1973 I became a Christian. And it was quite a change for me because I came out of a big party background. And I needed, I needed to have some, some solid foundation or I would have fallen back easily and quickly. So by God's grace, I, I was immediately introduced to solid teachers like J.I. Packer, John Stott, C.S. Lewis, Francis Schaeffer, R.C. Sproul, and other wonderful writers who had a profound influence on me. And their theology and love for the Lord kept me from slipping back into the old lifestyle, um, but positively helped me to understand and to really grow and my knowledge of my love for the Lord. So just to let you know a little bit about me, as this is a, the intro to this whole series on, on theology, I went to seminary and um, was ordained in 85, and I was a pastor for many years, and I had the honor of preaching the whole counsel of God. You'll see that I'm sitting now because this is not church, and I'm not preaching. I'm, I'm teaching. And I invite you to, to fact check everything I say. Um, I want you to. Um, again, by way of introduction, I've written a book entitled Seeing Ghosts Through God's Eyes uh, because I have a passion about helping people who are confused about the paranormal. And I'm working on a second um book now, and I, I've been deeply involved in helping folks who are struggling with demonic oppression, helping them to get out of that. Um, that, along with some friends of mine, has been um, a big part of my life for the last, last 10 years. We do live in a very pagan culture in which mindless experience is the key to spirituality but it leads to delusion and demonic oppression. We and our children need as much biblical content as possible. And I really believe, y'all, that the most loving thing that you can do as a parent and grandparent is to grow your knowledge of solid theology, biblical theology, which leads to a deeper love for God. In a sense, every Christian is a theologian, for better or for worse. And the for worse aspect is no small matter. The epistles and Jesus warn us that heresies are destructive attacks by wolves against God's sheep. And you know what wolves do to sheep. They tear them up. Therein, that's my passion for this series because I've seen just too much of that destruction. Gallup recently did a poll, and it left me speechless, and deeply sad, because it revealed an astonishing amount of biblical and theological ignorance amongst um, professing Christians. And this was a, an, a, an astonishingly high amount of lack of knowledge, basic theological and biblical knowledge. And it also revealed that, that um, American Christians were having very little impact on our culture and that our faith is making very little difference in our lives as far as our ethics. So um, that's where I, I do really do believe that solid teaching would make a, a difference and it breaks my heart to see uh, the struggles that people are having, uh, falling back into 
um, their old lifestyles. And my passion is to take profound truth and to make it understandable and to catch on fire. So I invite you on a journey of discovery together to delve deeply into the meat of God's Word. Because I really believe that those of you who are listening and many, many Christians out there are hungering, really hungering for solid meat, but they don't really know where to go to get it. And I want to do my humble part to help in that regard by teaching solid meat. You know, the Bible says that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The ideas that don't just flit around our brains momentarily, but the ones that really penetrate the heart of the ideas that shape our lives. And ideas have legs, as it were, consequences. We are what we think. Sound theology is required for a godly life because we have to first know the truth before we can do the truth. So no Christian can avoid theology. Some may strenuously deny it, but every Christian has a theology. The issue is, do we have a sound theology? Do we embrace true or false doctrine? Now, you may be surprised for me to put it this way, but every wrong belief that I, as Mark Hunneman, have, every wrong belief that I embrace is sin because it's ultimately traceable to me not loving God with all of my mind. So before giving me a concrete basis for studying theology, let me address several common misconceptions or concerns um, that folks have, uh, that, that maybe you might have about theology. Number one, first, doesn't Jesus talk about embracing the kingdom with childlike faith in Mark 10, 15? Doesn't that imply a simple faith? Yes. Yes, he does. But there's a world of difference between a childlike faith and a childish faith. The childish faith is obstinate and refuses to bow before authority and settles for a diet of spiritual milk. The implicit trust of a child is something that we never grow out of. But we are to grow into maturity, which takes solid meat. In quoting from Hebrews, it says, about uh, this, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become so dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. There's, there is not a disjunction between doctrine and practice, as many people think. Sound doctrine should lead to sound living. Okay, secondly, many Christians have developed an aversion, a dislike to theology because of their distrust of theologians. And boy, do I understand that. And I have personally experienced firsthand the devastating effects of, quote, higher critical methods of scholarship in college, which is just a mask for unbelief and often the shoddy scholarship. But most seriously, these, um, these theologians who are not... Um, committed to the Word of God, as the Word of God, they have vandalized God's Holy Word and caused serious damage to people. Uh, it was terrible to watch in college the number of uh, vicious spiritual wounds inflicted in, in the New Testament, Old Testament classes. It, it doesn't um, uh, surprise me that folks have a, a, an inbuilt suspicion of theology just because of how many horrible experiences folks have had with theologians and theology in their own um, life and, and in their own training and, and uh, schooling. I understand that because academia is filled with wolves 
who are unregenerate pagans who are intellectually arrogant. But please remember that we must not throw out the baby with the bathwater. And get this, please. To reject theology is to commit spiritual suicide. All right, third. The false, or there is a false pietism of our day that denigrates the mind. But if you look closely, the pattern in Scripture is deep doctrine first and then application. For example, in Romans, which is as bad as deep and meaty as you can get from chapters 1 through 11, Paul, there is a transition in chapter 12 where he says, Therefore, be transformed through the renewing of your what? The renewing of your minds. So the apostolic and Jesus model is solid doctrine, which leads to application of our lives, to our lives. Um, New Testament Christianity is not mindless Christianity. It emphasizes the mind, and, and that's one of the main distinctions between our faith and Eastern spirituality. Fourthly, some folks are concerned that theology breeds arguments and controversy, and, and yes, doctrine does cause controversy because truth implies error, and error must be confronted, or we accommodate it by our silence. And much too much of that has been done. What kind of world do we want our grandkids to live in? I'm really asking that question. What kind of world do we want our kids and grandkids to, to live in? Depends on how we respond. Jesus' Jesus's life was a storm cloud of controversy, as was Paul's, because truth matters. It is godless controversy that we are to avoid, not godly controversy, which is needed from time to time. To avoid all controversy is to avoid Christ. We are not to argue about non-important issues. And we need to remember that the mark of a Christian is love. John 13. Fifthly, um, I think we have been unconsciously influenced by the relativization and subjectivism of, tr of the tr truth. The concept of truth has changed, and this has belittled the importance of the content of truth and of the intellect. But see, one of the glories of the Christian faith is that it is a system of coherent, rational truth. It's much more than a system of truth, but it's not less. We should rejoice in this in light of the contentless, mindless spirituality of the pagan New Age, Eastern uh, spirituality. You know, the idea of one hand clapping, that may sound profound, but it means nothing rational, if you think about it. I recently did a video on the Cosmic Christ, and I chose that title carefully because I wanted to catch the attention of New Agers and I wanted to accent the cosmic dimensions of the atonement, Christus Victor, as it's called. Um, but it was mainly to show the content of the true Christ versus the myth of the pagan conception of Christ. So, um, suppose someone says, why theology? All I need is to love Jesus. Well, what I would say is, which Jesus? The New Age Jesus, the Jehovah's Witness Jesus, and so on. And who is Jesus? So is God and man, how does that work? And what, what, did, what did he do? What happened on the cross? Um, and then second, love. You know, there's no more meaningless word in the English language now, unfortunately. Love can be defined and expressed in a thousand different ways. So what does it mean to love Jesus? And Jesus himself said, teaching them all that I have commanded them or commanded you. So what is the positive role of theology in this series that I'm doing? Well, you know, just 
was is very is based on a, a personal model as the Bible is. God is an infinite person. Just as we get to know a person better as we know more about them, so our knowledge and love for God should grow as we study about who he is, his person and his work, both in creation and redemption. For our souls be inflamed with a passion for God, then at first, it first has to pass pass through our minds. Let me quote from C.S. Lewis here. He, this is in the, he, he's discussing the difference between devotional books and books of doctrine or theology. Um, and the difference. He says, now the layman or, ancient, uh, or amateur needs to be instructed as well as to be exhorted. In this age, his need for knowledge is particularly pressing. So he's talking about doctrine. Nor would I admit any sharp division between the two kinds of book. You're talking about devotion or uh, in doctrine. For my part, I tend to find the doctrinal books often more helpful in devotion than the devotional books. And I rather suspect that the same experience may await many others. I believe that many who find that, quote, nothing happens when they sit down or kneel down to a book of devotion would find that their heart sings unbidden while they're working their way through a tough bit of theology with a pipe in their teeth and a pencil in their hand. <laughs> it's classic C.S. Lewis. I know that to be true because I've read some of my um, favorite theologians and as they go deep so to speak that's when my soul starts to sing um, and this is a series in which I want the profound things of scripture to be accessible to everyone because the Bible is accessible to everyone it, it was the naked truth of the Bible is to be understood by everyone, and it's sufficient for everyone as a guide for loving God and living a godly life. You know, I'm at a point in my life at age 62 where I want to record the truths of God's Word. Knowledge without devotion is cold, dead orthodoxy. I admit that. But also, devotion without knowledge is irrational instability. One is left vulnerable to the wolves, to being undiscerning to the wiles of the devil. And I, I have seen folks like you have fall left and right. Uh, recently, a, a friend went back to being a witch and... You know, I wrote that book for a reason about earthbound spirits. And I'm wondering how, if a person is tra trained in, in knowing the depths of Scripture, how in the world could they believe in a notion of earthbound spirits when it is so, earthbound spirits being ghosts, it, which is so contrary to sound biblical theology and uh, the, the teaching of the Bible as a whole. And we become gullible to so many trends because of our, our ignorance. Um, quoting from Ephesians 4, and this was the main text that came to my mind when I thought about this introduction. Paul says, the Lord through Paul, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. 
and, and get this, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Oh, that just says it all there. What was the first thing that the devil said? Did God say? It's in the area of truth that Satan first attacked and continues to attack. There's a saying in sports that the best defense is a strong offense. And what is true in sports is even more true in spirituality, and that is the best defense is a strong offense. That is knowing deep meat doctrine and theology, the Word of God. We need to avoid syncretism, which is the blending of non-Christian thought with the Bible, which was a problem going all the way back to the ancient Israelites. Solid theology helps to avoid syncretism because it helps us become discerning. You remember that example of how, I don't even know if it's true or not, but it's so common, the analogy of how they taught bank tellers to determine whether a, a note was counterfeit was not or not was by letting them handle the genuine article so much that they got the feel for the truth, so to speak, that when the counterfeit came, it would just be instinctive. And that's what I, I yearn for, my passion, is that by immersing ourselves in the truth that when we do encounter the counterfeit, it'll be immediately apparent that it's counterfeit and a scheme of the evil one and that we won't be tossed to and fro, that we'll have a solid foundation for our lives and to pass on to our children. So in closing, growing in the knowledge of God is a great joy and honor. It's a delight to the soul. Um, studying theology, it takes effort, just as studying the Word of God it takes discipline. But this, my friends, is a matter of life and death even eternal life and death. And this series of mine is designed that by God's grace, and I mean that, to enable us to love him more and to be more effective in our witness to a lost and broken world. So let's dig in, shall we? Thank you.